Endo coffee. I'm drinking coffee. <coughs> mm. Okay. Countdown thirty seconds. Okay. All right. Are we streaming? Okay. All right. Um, good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum uh, to my audience in Poland and in Egypt. Um, it's an honor with me to be today with my friends from Endostar and Paul Dent. Um, Anita and Anya have been very helpful in organizing these Endo coffee meetings, and I do have my coffee with me, so I'm ready to start. All right, my name is, uh, and a little introduction, my name is Dr. Ashraf Samir Rifai. I am an associate professor of endodontics and former head of department of El Azhar University uh, Endodontic Department in Cairo, Egypt. I founded the Integrated Dental Clinics in 1995. I am the director of the MRD Endodontic Program at Future University, and I'm a founding member of Excellence Endodontics um, uh, Social Media Group. This is my contact information. So... Uh, uh, please uh, uh, feel free to add me on Facebook and if you have any questions related to this uh, uh, Endo Coffee session or any other uh, material you would like, please uh, don't hesitate to contact me by email or best yet by Facebook. Okay, so today the topic for me is adult pulpotomies and I know that Endostar sells files and they can be a little upset for me that I didn't show endodontic cases 
but um, m um, I thought that this is an interesting topic, um, adult popotomies, the best thing to fill the root canal with. So um, it's a contentious issue, it's uh, been taking, um, um, it's been um, relived in the last few years and more endodontists around the world are using um, adult popotomies as a permanent definitive solution for their patients. All right, so I know that everybody, when he sees a case uh, like this, would love to do a micro-contracted access and start going through the sequence of preoperative, tooth length, working length, and then having a an end result like this. And this this particular case I did with E3 Azure, the Endostar file, and um, uh, but that's not the topic for today. I mean, I know it's it's very easy for you to fall into the <clears throat> the normal procedure of things is to go and do a root canal treatment for any tooth that has um, a vital exposure. Now, what is a pulpotomy procedure? A full pulpotomy involves the removal of the entire coronal portion of the vital pulp. And I, I'm, I'm okay. I'll start it. Is everything? I just want to make sure that I'm online. Am I online? Anya, Anita, could you please respond to me by message if you can see my, uh, my, uh, my stream? I'm just making sure. Everything is okay? Am I streaming? Um, can you see my stream? One moment. Okay, very good. So I'll, I'll keep on going. Very good. Okay, what is a pulpotomy procedure? Um, uh, as described by Nisreen Taha and uh, Associates in 2017, uh, it is a full pulpotomy involves the removal of the entire coronal portion of the vital pulp to the level of the coronal orifices while maintaining the health of the remaining radicular portion. So that's the textbook definition. Now, you can classify them in many ways according to the method of hemostasis. You can classify them as regular pulpotomy or laser pulpotomy or electrocautery pulpotomy. That's how you maintain hemostasis. Or the amount of pulp removed. It can be a miniature pulpotomy where you remove part of the coronal pulp, a full pulpotomy where you remove the pulp to the orifices, or a partial pulpectomy where you go into the canals and remove a portion of the pulp in the radicular tooth, in the radicular portion of the root canals. It can be deciduous or an adult pulpotomy. In this case, we're discussing adult pulpotomies. And it can be classified according to the material placed on the pulp stumps into calcium hydroxide pulpotomy, MTA pulpotomy, formocrisal pulpotomy, glutaraldehyde pulpotomy. So depending on the material that you put on the pulp, you can give it a name. So these are the ways by which we classify pulpotomies. So I'm going to start with one of my cases. This was a 44-year-old female. I remember her very well. She was the wife of a dentist. He had previously restored her wisdom tooth, her lower right uh, wisdom tooth, and she was complaining of intermittent pain and pain with cold stimulus. And I, I, I immediately looked at the tooth and I said, oh, what, what am I going to be doing a root canal for a tooth like this, uh, a, a lower right eight or wisdom tooth? So this is the preoperative x-ray you can see there and then that's immediately after access and you can see bleeding and then there you have the hemostasis I'm trying to stop the bleeding here the bleeding is nearly stopped close up and then I'm just applying pressure with a paper point and I've established hemostasis you can see very clearly the two pulp stumps of the wisdom tooth and here's a video where I'm applying the MTA okay so here, I'm applying uh, bi bi a bioceramic material, or ca um, hydraulic calcium silicate, and I'm applying it and condensing it using condensers. There you go. And then application, applying, a little, just tapping it into position so it comes in uh, approximation to the pulp stump. And then, you can see here, I use sometimes the opposite side of a paper point. If my uh, MTA is a little too uh, dry, uh, wet, 
um, too wet and I apply a little paper point and then here I'm cleaning up the cavity using a brush there you go and then cleaning up the cavity and then I've isolated my pop and it's now time to restore it so that, that would be the sequence of events in a popotomy and that's your post-operative you can see how complex the anatomy is, we've got a 90 degree curvature here, you've got very acute curvatures very limited um, uh, mouth opening so here you have your pulp stumps very clearly uh, with, pulp, with uh, MTA on those pulp stumps okay so when I come to evaluate why did I choose to do this first of all the patient didn't want to extract Secondly, the patient had limited mouth opening. I would have had an impossible time doing a root canal treatment, plus the complexity of the anatomy. Limited mouth opening, difficult to reach, um, um, wisdom tooth is not indicated unless it is really necessary for restoration. But in this case, the dentist, uh, the husband wanted to retain the tooth, so I suggested um, pulp, pulp, um, pulpotomy, and the patient accepted, and I did that. Okay, so the steps of a pulpotomy, you have um, anesthesia, then access cavity preparation, removal of coronal pulp, and then hemostasis, which is very critical. Then application of the hydraulic calcium silicate material, like uh, bioceramic materials, and then you have restoration and follow-up. Uh, the types of, uh, the okay, you can use any type of hydraulic calcium silicate materials. Um, there are many types like MTA, Biodentin, and the one by Endostar, which is endo repair material. These are all the materials which you can use for uh, a placement on the pulp stump. Right, this is case number two. Is a 24-year-old dentist in this case. Uh, when I started doing these cases in the beginning, I, would, I was a little worried, so I always pick people who understood what I was doing. So, 24-year-old dentist, patient came in for routine filling, um, um, had mild pain related to a premolar, and during excavation, exposure occurred. Here's a close-up of the excavation. You can still see caries on the, on the pulpal wall. And here is the access cavity. And then a close-up of the two canals, the buccal and the palatal. And you can see that hemostasis has been established. Here I'm placing uh, paper points on the bleeding uh, stumps. But because they're further into the canal, um, I can't apply a cotton pellet. So in this case, I applied large paper points, uh, moist paper points, to uh, encourage hemostasis. Then I placed my um, bioceramic material, and that's the final x-ray. You can see here, I actually did, in this case, not a miniature pulpotomy or a full pulpotomy. I did a complete, uh, I did a partial pulpectomy, where I removed about 2 or 3 millimeters within the root canal space. Now... What was the alternative to the pulpotomy? A complete root canal treatment, but the patient was not complaining of any pain. He was, he was, he, but during excavation, there was exposure was there. Uh, so in this case, I did um, a partial pulpectomy. And why did I go in for a partial pulpectomy? Because there was a deep isthmus. If I had just done a full pulpectomy at the level of the orifice, it would have been a very large area of the pulp in contact with the MTA. So in this case, I went down to the point of bifurcation, and each, each stump was capped separately, the buccal canal and the palatal canal. Um, this is case number three, again. This is a 30-year-old patient, persistent pain, on a previously placed composite restoration on an upper first molar, and there were symptoms of irreversible pulpitis. The pain would, uh, would last for about 10 seconds, after application of cold stimulus and uh, so in this case I was already going to do um, uh, the, for the patient I was going to do a root canal treatment so I scheduled him for a root canal treatment and when I opened up my access cavity you can see here I realized that the bleeding was very minimal I was able to control bleeding, bleeding very quickly and here you can see the bleeding under control and then application of my bioceramics there you go and the final okay so 
in this case, I was not going to do a pulpotomy from the beginning. In this case, I was going to do a regular root canal treatment. But when I realized that the pulp was not bleeding so aggressively, in this case, I chose to give my patient the option of um, um, a full pulpotomy instead of um, uh, uh, doing a root canal treatment. I, I gave him the pros and cons, and I explained what the problems were that there is a potential that this uh, pulpotomy procedure may fail and may require root canal treatment in the future. So I gave the patient the choice. The patient liked the fact that he could finish the procedure in, in, in one visit, and there was always a potential that he could retain some of his uh, uh, normal pulp. So I went ahead and I did the pulpotomy. Now, this is an unusual case. This case number four is a traumatic injury case. It's a 15-year-old boy who had a bike accident. Okay, sharp injury fell onto some ceramic flooring and he fractured his upper central and the patient came ill with mild bruising of the lips, no pain related to the tooth and the tooth was fractured and this is the preoperative of the, of the boy. And here you can see a palatal view, there is an attached fractured segment of the, of the tooth. This is after removal of the segment. You can still see here a piece of attachment of periodontal ligaments still attached. So it was slightly fractured, slightly at the level of the bone. And this is after removal. And this is the incisal view. You can see shadow of the pulp here. And... Um, there it is after I did a little cauterization to stop the bleeding. I did a buildup, pre-endo buildup, and then I was worried. Should I do a, 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 a root canal for this, or is this not exposed? When I applied the probe, there was no penetration into the pulp chamber, but the color was very um, unsettling for me. So I started entering into the pulp space, and you can see here there was a blood clot. So the trauma had caused a blood clot in the pulp horn, I moved further into the tooth and then you could see vital pulp with controlled bleeding and this is after I reached uh, after the cervical line maybe after the cervix of the tooth I started applying my bioceramic material there and that's the uh, final x-ray before restoration in this case I did a, a partial pulpectomy I went in further but the reason I went in further for two, two reasons. First of all, the, the fracture line was very deep. And number two, sometimes when you are um, trying to remove pulp very deep in the canal, you don't have a lot of control over how much pulp you remove per application of your instruments. And then in this case, I again, uh, there you can see the filling I did. I reattached the segment. I bonded and then I attached the segment and completed uh, composite restoration there you go and that's the final result okay so there is the palatal view as well you can see it's nice and clean and there is a good emergence profile this is the post-operative x-ray and you can see there's a very beautiful emergence profile and the, pa the patient will retain this tooth for quite a while um, I have a, I think I have a three-year follow-up or two-year follow-up of this case. Patient's doing fine, and everything's as stable. Now, the question was, why not do a complete root canal treatment? And this question is here is very is a big dilemma because when I start with this child at 15 years old to, uh, to go through the process of root canal treatment, enlargement of the canals, and probably a post and core buildup, in in this case. I am reducing the longevity of this tooth because the life cycle of a tooth would be restoration, then maybe root canal, build up, then crown. And so by the time this child reaches, say, 20, 25, he will probably have already lost his tooth. In this case, I'm giving time for this tooth so that we don't have to go through the process of root canal while he's 15. We can wait until he's a little older, until it becomes symptomatic. In this case, the option of root canal is still viable. And then by then he can start placing a post core while he's in his 20s or 30s and last with this tooth to maybe when he's 40 or 50. But in the contrary, if we start at 15, he's probably going to lose this tooth very early on in his life. 
All right, so there are many other success cases. This is a case where you have an upper six here as well with, uh, with a nice curved roots. Here, both of the six and the four have, been, have underwent um, um, pulpotomies. Neither of, them, neither of them had severe symptoms. They were both um, being, were coming in for regular um, um, fillings, but during excavation, exposure was imminent. In this case, we did a pulpotomy. We could have, in, uh, but when, when, when the pulp exposure is very small, we do do direct pulp cappings, but when it's large, I prefer to go in for a pulp pulpotomy and be safe. And this is a mandibular, so we just don't do in maxillaries. This is a mandibular molar where we also did partial pulpectomy in, in the root canals. All right, so is that to say that all cases succeed? No, some, some cases fail. There, it's, not, it's not a must for us to succeed in every single case. Some cases show failure. Now, this was a case I did in 2015. You can see it was very nice curves here. And again, this was a dentist. And one of the drawbacks, which a lot of people will tell you about pulpotomies, is the fact that when you do a pulpotomy, um, and the pulp will recede and it will calcify, making root canal treatment different, difficult in the future. Now, the, uh, this may be true when we were doing formocresal pulpotomies in which we placed materials which don't maintain the vitality of the pulp. Formocresal, pul pul Pulpotec, all those um, paraformaldehyde-based materials would result in um, necrosis of the pulp, slow death of the pulp, and obviously uh, calcification. Now this is a case which failed. I'm not saying that all cases succeeded. This actually failed in 2015 and the patient went to another dentist in 2019. The dentist was not a micro dentist, was not using a microscope, so he was unable to remove the MTA properly and during his procedure he perforated in the forcation, and you can see here. And um, the reason that she went was because simply uh, the tooth had fractured. There was no pain, but there is obviously radiographic signs of failure in 2020. But what, that, what I would like to show is that the root canals have not calcified. You can see the distal canals and you can see the mesial canals very clearly after five years of pulpotomy, which failed. So the idea of canals calcifying to the point where they're not manageable, this may have been true in former creasal pulpotomies, but it's less true when it comes to materials like bioceramics, MTAs, which uh, will preserve the pulp and will not fix them. Okay, so what determines success and failure in pulpotomies? The number one determ determining factor is the state of inflammation. Obviously, the more inflamed the pulp is, the less successful your pulpotomy procedures are. And this can be evaluated clinically and radiographically. I mean, if you have a widening of the periodontal membrane space, that's not a good sign. I'm not saying that there is some research which has shown that its uh, pulpotomies have been effective in cases with a widening and in cases with signs of irreversible pulpitis. But to be safe, obviously, the less inflamed the pulp is, the more successful your pulpotomy procedures may be. So how do you determine this clinically? Obviously, two things. You, you do clinical tests and you see how long pain lingers after stimulus. You take radiographic um, 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 radiographs of your teeth um, to see the um, widening and uh, of periodontal membrane space or the presence or absence of lesions. And finally, the really big determining factor is how long it takes to stop the bleeding of the pulp. Now, there has been research which has been done to evaluate uh, the correlation between histological the status of the pulp and clinical symptoms. And, there, and in this research um, um, here, you have th this uh, um, um, Mandana in Iran. He found that the, um, there is a good agreement between clinical and histological pulp diagnosis. When you see symptoms like extended pain on stimulus, this does reflect irreversible pulpitis, minimal pain on stimulus, also shows that this is early, early stage um, irreversible pulpitis. Furthermore, most of the research done on pulpotomies usually wait for two minutes to establish hemostasis. And then if they don't establish hemostasis in two minutes, they try again for four minutes and six minutes. But obviously, the longer it takes to achieve hemostasis, the more inflamed your pulp is. Um, personally, in my personal experience, I like to stay within the two to four minute time frame, if I cannot establish 
a good hemostasis within two to four minutes, I usually uh, convert this case into a root canal treatment. This is another research done by Nisreen Taha, the group in Jordan, and they, they assessed mineral trioxide aggregate with pulpotomies in mature teeth with carious exposures. Now, we're not talking about non-carious exposures, we're talking about probably infected pulp, and in this study, they evaluated for three years. Clinically, they had a success rate of 97.5, and 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 and, um, and radiographically, 92.7 percent. So this is these are these are really large numbers, uh, very um, um, big percentages of success. Uh, this another one um, study um, here where it was done over 62 months, and the success rate was 87.3 um, percent, which is very high, and. Um, uh, these these uh, these numbers include here cases with irreversible pulpitis and the presence of slight periapical radiolucency. And in this case, 84% of the cases with irreversible pulpitis succeeded, and 76% of the cases with a widening of the periapical area also succeeded. So we're not just talking about cases which are purely non-symptomatic. Again, Nasrin Taha, she's been doing a lot of work on this. They evaluated biodentin as uh, um, uh, in adult uh, pulpotomies with symptoms of irreversible pulpitis. And this was, uh, again, um, I think um, uh, a one-year study. And they did 100%, um, you know, they got, after one year, 100% clinical success and 98.4% radiographic success based on the system of evaluation that they chose. So what you're seeing here is a successive amount of research which is showing that the use of pulpotomies to treat inflamed vital pulp is, is succeeding. Now, we historically have not been teaching our general dentists to do pulpotomies because pulpotomies in the past were a temporary non-definitive procedure which involved purposefully fixing the pulp with necro necrotizing agents like um, um, pulperil, CMCP or uh, formocresol and then intentionally uh, killing the pulp to reduce pain but not intentionally trying to keep the pulp vital. So um, uh, I hope um, um, this um, session of Endo Coffee was um, beneficial to you and please stay tuned with Endo Coffee. Anya and Anita are doing an excellent job with our next speaker, Piotr Wujek. Um, and I hope uh, you had fun listening to my lecture. And I'm ready for any questions. And thank you very much. Um, okay, Anita has asked me a question. If we carry out a single visit, do we put some extra material between MTA and gutta percha? If you're doing a pulpotomy, you're not going to need gutta percha. But uh, when you place MTA specifically inside the canal, you will also need to temporize from four to six hours with uh, um, a, a moist cotton pellet to allow for complete setting of the MTA. If you're using more of the recent generation of uh, bioceramic materials, some of them set very quickly so you can restore immediately. But if you're using regular MTA, I usually place a cotton, wet cotton pellet and I place a semi-temporary filling using maybe a comprimer for a day. And the next day I bring my patient in and I complete my restoration. Uh, Anita, I don't understand what you mean by extra material between the MTA and the gutta percha. If you could explain, I will answer.
Uh -huh. Okay, so Anita is asking me a question if I understand correctly. How can you remove the MTA in the case that the case fails in the future? Well, obviously we are in the age of microendodontic treatment and the further the MTA is placed in the canal, the more difficult it becomes to remove without uh, magnification and ultrasonics. But usually if a case comes in with a failing case, I remove my restorative material and I remove my, my, my um, bioceramics using um, thin ultrasonic instruments. Uh, even if uh, in the pro in the case that the MTA, um, I'm being asked by uh, by Anya, what is your procedure if MTA uh, requires etching above it? Which is true. After we finish the MTA placement, you will re probably restore with a composite restoration. So, what is the problem with acid etch on top of MTA? Nothing. If MTA has set, there is no problem at all. But you will not be able to use an acid etch on top of MTA when it has not set yet. That's why. If you're not using a fast setting bioceramic material, uh, like say biodentin, in this case you will have to wait for four to six hours until the MTA has become rock hard. Once it has become rock hard, you can etch above it, it will be no problem at all, and apply your bonding agent and then restore using composite. Uh, I'm being asked another question how big the perforation should be to begin the treatment and how small to skip it? Uh, do you mean uh, uh, perforation of the root canals or perforation into the pulp space, uh, Anya? What do you mean? I've been asked a question here, how big the perforation should be to begin the treatment and how small to skip it? If you're talking about perforation into the pulp space, generally uh, um, a per, um, uh, an exposure of less than 0.5 millimeter, you will be able to restore uh, with direct pulp capping. Any larger than that, I don't suggest because the larger the area of pulp exposed, um, the more direct the occlusal forces will be on it. When we do a pulpotomy, we, we, we distance the pulp stumps from the occlusal forces. I find that if it depends also on the surface which the exposure has happened. If it's on the lateral surface of the cavity, say on the axial surface, in this case, I would do, but if it's more on the occlusal surface, I don't like placing direct pulp uh, capping materials uh, on the occlusal surface. Any more questions? Uh, if you want to do this in during one visit, you cannot use uh, slow setting MTA. You will have to use something uh, that sets very quickly. For instance, biodentin sets in about 11 to 13 minutes. Uh, I've been asked a question right now. Uh, how much time must pass between when I finish my MTA application to when I can do my restoration? Uh, if you, like I said, if you're using MTA material, it requires moisture to set. So you will not be able to apply your restorative materials unless the MTA has set. For the MTA to set, it requires moisture and about four to six hours, depending on the type of material on the manufacturer, but uh, you will not be able to restore immediately, unless, like I said, you're using uh, a material which sets on the spot. If anybody has any questions, please post on the on the page and I will answer them. I have no problem at all. Um, 
Okay, Ani is asking me, how can I control the condensation of MTA to avoid perforation? Uh, if, if you mean perfor by perforation, you mean by pushing the material into the pulp, MTA or bioceramic materials are not condensed like we condense amalgam or composite. They are lightly tapped so that they adapt to the surface of the pulp. But we are not trying to compact the MTA into the pulp chamber to place pressure under the pulp. In the contrary, I want it to lie passively on the pulp, but in adaptation and in contact. If that's what uh, Anya means, I have answered the question. Um, um, if it's other than this, Anya, please uh, explain. If, if there's something more that needs to be explained. Um, Anya is asking me something, I think, outside of the, the scope of the, the question. Um, what is better, move MTA over the apex or not using apical plug technique? Um, but this is not what we are discussing today, but I will discuss it anyway. Um, when we place MTA into the apical part of the canal, it has limitations. MTA is a very messy material. It's very difficult to compact and condense. Uh, especially in curved canals in the apical area. So when we are dealing with open apices, I, I never use gutta persia. I always use MTA because open apices, you, can, you have very difficult, difficulty controlling the length and um, uh, position of your uh, apical filling. With MTA, you can lightly apply it and without, without compaction, and this will result in a more sealed apical area. Uh, if this is what Anya means, then I have answered your question. I'm ready for any more questions. Anya, Anita. Are we done? Okay.